welcome everyone. Um, I always want to say good evening, but it could be good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, but no matter where you are, thank you for being here. Today, we are joined by multi-award winning writer, anthropologist, explorer, and acclaimed photographer, Wade Davis. Wade's work has taken him from the Amazon to Tibet, Africa to Australia, Polynesia to the Arctic. He is the best-selling author of more than a dozen books, including The Serpent and the Rainbow, and currently holds the post of National Geographic Explorer in Residence. In this talk, Wade will take us on an illustrated journey across the web of spiritual and cultural life that envelops our planet, seeking answers to the fundamental question, what does it mean to be alive? After Wade's talk, there will be an audience Q&A, so feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Wade Davis. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, it's nice to be back. Um, I was only with, with the uh, How To Academy a few days ago, uh, and this is a kind of a reprieve of the talk that I gave in 2018 uh, when we were able to gather um, together. It's really the story of culture around the world. You know, one of the great um, pleasures of travel, as I'm sure most of us can ex have experienced, is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel the past and the wind, uh, touch it in stones polished by rain, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that as we sort of do this internet um, gathering um, today, uh, in the Amazon, Jaguar shaman are still journeying beyond the Milky Way. And in the, in the high Arctic, the, um, let's just see here. Oops, we've, let's see, why are we not getting, sorry about this data. Somehow there's a problem with the, we had this problem before with you guys. There we go, let's see if that's, then the, the high Arctic, the, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning and that in the Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma, is to remember kind of the central revelation of anthropology. And that's the idea that the world into which you were born does not exist in some absolute sense, but is just one model of reality. The consequence of one set of adaptive choices that your lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, a yak herder in the slopes of Shomalungma, an eagle hunter in Kazakhstan, or a thunderhoof shaman in Mongolia, all of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of being, other ways of thinking, and other ways of orienting yourself in social and political and spiritual ecological space. And that's an idea that if you think about it can only fill you with hope. Now together, the myriad of cultures of the world make up a kind of a social web of life that envelops the planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as is the biological web of life that you know as a biosphere. And you could think of this cultural web of life as being an ethnosphere. And you could define the ethnosphere as a sum total of all thoughts and dreams, ideas and inspirations, myths and memories brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative and imaginative species. And just as the biosphere is being severely impacted with the loss of habitat, so too the ethnosphere, but if anything, at a far greater rate. Few biologists would suggest that 50% of plants and animals are on the brink of extinction. Dire as the situation indeed is. And yet that the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of that, of course, is language loss. When each of us were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on earth. Now, a language isn't just a body of vocabulary or a set of grammatical rules. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of every culture comes into the material world. Every language I once wrote was an old growth forest of the mind, a, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages, by absolute academic consensus, half aren't being taught to children, which means they're on the brink of extinction. Now, there are many people who say, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't 
uh, communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be easier for us to get along? And my answer to that is always to say, what a great idea, but let's make that language Mongolian. Let's make it Inuktitut. Let's make it uh, Haida. And you suddenly begin to feel as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped by silence, to have no ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. Uh, and yet that is the fate of somebody somewhere on earth every fortnight, because on average, every two weeks, some elder passes away and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. And the reason this is so particularly poignant in this moment in history is that it's occurring in the very same era in which science has come to the fore to prove the truth of the central revelation of social anthropology, which is cultural relativism. Within the last generation, geneticists in particular have revealed that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Race is an utter fiction. We're all cut from the same genetic cloth. In fact, we all are descendants of that same handful of hominids who walked out of Africa some 65,000 years ago and then embarked on this extraordinary diaspora, 40,000 years in duration, 2,500 human generations that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But here's a remarkable thing. If you accept that we are cut from the same genetic cloth, it means by definition that every population shares the same raw genius. And how that genius is expressed is simply a matter of choice. Uh, we may celebrate technological wizardry, the people of Australia, Aboriginal people of Australia may invest their mental acuity in the complex task of unraveling the mystic threads of memory inherent in a myth. The critical point is that that old Victorian idea inspired by evolutionary biology, that cultures evolved, that we somehow went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the Strand of London, that European society with its technological excellence stood at the apex of a pyramid that sloped down the sides to the so-called primitives of the world has absolutely been debunked by modern science and shown to be an artifact of the 19th century as irrelevant to our lives today as a notion that clergymen had in that time that the earth was but 6,000 years old. In this stunning affirmation of the human spirit, genetics has come to the fore to prove the truth of this fundamental intuition of anthropology. The idea that every culture has something to say, each deserves to be heard just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. The other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being modern, failed attempts at being us, Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 voices of humanity. And those answers and those voices collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us in the coming centuries. So to lose half of humanity's linguistic diversity is to lose half of our collective social, cultural, ecological, and spiritual knowledge. And this does not have to happen. But what do we do about it? You know, if you're a biologist and you identify an area of high species endemism, you try to make a protected area. You can't make a rainforest park of the mind. You can't sequester people like some kind of zoological specimen. Change is the one constant in human affairs. All peoples everywhere are always dancing with new possibilities for life. So when I was recruited in 2000 to become the social anthropologist at the National Geographic, as part of our conservation mission, the question is, what do we do? And the decision was made that, that politicians you know, follow, they rarely lead, polemics aren't persuasive, but storytellers change the world. So I propose that we go out into the ethnosphere to make films and write books and tell stories of, of human practices so inherently dazzling that you cannot learn about them without coming away with a new appreciation of the wonder of the human spirit as brought into being by culture. So let's visit some of these places that we went and let's begin with the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination and that of course is Polynesia. Tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon a southern sea. 
And I sailed with the Hokalea, this reconstructed catamaran inspired by the drawings that Joseph Banks did as he sailed with Captain Cook in the 18th century. And even today, the Polynesian sailors can name 220 stars in the night sky. They can sense the presence of distant atolls beyond the horizon by watching the reverberation of waves across the hull of the vessel, knowing full well that every island group has its own refractive pattern that could be read like a forensic scientist reads a fingerprint. Men who in the darkness, the hull can distinguish several uh, swells moving through the vessel at any one time, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the Pacific and be followed with the same ease with which a terrestrial explorer would follow a river to the sea. Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. But the amazing thing about this tradition is that it had no written word and it was the navigation was based on dead reckoning. So the wayfinder only knew where he was or she was by remembering precisely how they got there. And it was the impossibility of using dead reckoning on a long oceanic voyage that kept most European transports hugging the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of the chronometer. But we know for a scientific fact that 10 centuries before Christ, the ancestors of the Polynesians set sail into the rising sun. And in very short order, 80 generations settled every island group in the Pacific. Now, if we move for a moment into the Amazon, the greatest forest on earth, the homeland of the people of the Anaconda who live so closely to the forest, they don't distinguish the color green from the color blue because the canopy of the heavens is the canopy of the rainforest. The Warani, a remarkable people of the Eastern forest, true natural philosophers who understand the forest as they do because their lives are built upon that. And having approached that forest with all the genius of the human spirit and mind, they've made these extraordinary discoveries, which drew us as botanical explorers. Karari, the flying death, which yielded D. tubo Karari, the muscle relaxant that transformed surgery in the 1940s. The alchemic, alchemic, alchemical ability of these individuals to combine plants in curious ways, the, 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 the glory of the shamanic vision, if you will, the exemplar of which, of course, is ayahuasca, the vision vine. Now, these psychoactive plants um, are, 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 are powerful sacred medicines, but here you see the Yanomami blowing the snuff up the noses of a plant called ebene, which contains tryptamines. So this is a critical to this story. They blow it up the nose because tryptamines are orally inactive. They cannot be taken orally because they're denatured by an enzyme in the human gut. The curious thing is that we go across to the Northwest Amazon and the Barasana and the Tucano and the Macuna and the Tanimucos or the Cofan in Ecuador. Here you have ayahuasca made, the vision vine, the vine of the soul, but it's not a vine, it's a preparation. The shrubs, the leaves of a nondescript shrub in the coffee family, Psychotria viridis, full of these tryptamines, but also the bark of a woody liana, totally different plant, which has beta carbolines, which turn out to be MAO inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate the tryptamines found in those leaves. But forget about the chemistry, but here's the amazing question. How in a flora of, at, at the very least, 80,000 species of vascular plants, did the indigenous people learn to combine these distinct denizens of the rainforest in this profound way to create a biochemical version of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts? The only scientific explanation is trial and error, which statistically is exposed as a meaningless euphemism. The people say the plants teach us. What does that mean? Well, what we do, do know is that we know so little um, about the life ways of the people of the forest. When I first lived in the Northwest Amazon, it seemed like a kind of a, a, a sad place overrun by rubber barons and missionaries. And just to emphasize that this, this path to cultural erosion is not one way. In the 1980s, a Colombian president, Virgilio Barco, said to a young anthropologist, Martin von Hildebrand, to do something, quote, for the Indians in five incredible years 
Martine set aside lands the size of the United Kingdom for the 57 ethnicities of the Northwest Amazon and behind a veil of isolation created by the modern conflict of Colombia, a new dream of culture was born. Stephen Hugh Jones, the head of anthropology at Cambridge, once was part of a film in which he described the people with whom he had lived for so long, the Barasana, he predicted their demise in a world of disappearing cultures. He came back to join us as we made this film, as he walked into one of these great malokas, the heart of the kindred, the, the, the symbol of the universe, if you will. He encountered 250 men in full ritual regalia, and he got on his phone, the satellite phone to his wife back in London, and he said, darling, you won't believe what I'm seeing. The only thing that disappeared are the missionaries. And indeed, what Stephen had witnessed was a cultural revival of extraordinary extent. When we asked the elders, why did you allow the missionaries to stay as long as they did? The Indians said that they promised to make us human. This is the essence of colonization, to persuade the colonized of their own inherent inferiority. And this cultural renaissance came not a moment too soon, because we now understand that the Barasana and the Makuna are in fact the direct descendants of the great civilizations that Aureliana encountered in 1541 when he traveled the length of the Amazon with social structures that facilitate peace and exchange, not war, not the least of which is a marriage rule that says you must speak somebody who, you must marry someone who speaks a different language and in any one longhouse, six and seven languages, languages are spoken, who have rich cultural traditions, wisdom traditions that favor the man of knowledge to the warrior. And this is not hippie ethnography. Belief systems, the most profound uh, intuition of which is that plants and animals are just people in another dimension of reality. For the Barasana, people are not the problem, they are the solution. It is only people that can maintain the energetic balances of the world. And when they take ayahuasca or yahe in these great annual celebrations, hundreds of men in liminal space taking ayahuasca two days and two nights, not becoming symbols of the ancestors, literally becoming the ancestors, traveling back through mystic space, visiting the points of origin, reciting the toponyms of 1600 place names, running away the length of the Milk River, the journey of the ancestors arrived in the belly of the sacred serpents. In doing so, they are laying claim to their obligation to be the mediator between the wild and the realm of humanity. The shaman for the Barasana is not priest or physician. He's more like an engineer who periodically goes to the heart of the reactor to reprogram the world. While rising up into the Andes, we look at notions of sacred geography. What does it really mean when a people believe that a mountain is a deity as opposed to an inert body of rock? How does that play out? Why is it that in our Descartian tradition, we have deanimated the world, reducing plants and animals to props on a stage set that only humans uh, walk upon? This extractive model in which science has made a house cleaning of belief has become ubiquitous, but the triumph of secular material, materialism may be the conceit of modernity, but it shouldn't suggest that it's the norm, it's the anomaly. Most peoples of the world relate to the natural world through a mechanism of reciprocity. The simple idea that the earth owes its bounty to people, people owe their fidelity to the earth. The essence of coca leaves blown to the Apu deities. Apu deities that are embraced in rituals. This, the Mujimiento in Cusco, where the fastest young boy dresses as a woman, carrying the feminine energy to the mountaintops, an obligatory run that traverses the range of the, and the boundaries of the community lands. Extraordinary athletic achievement, running from 11,500 feet down to the base of the mountain, running to 16,000 feet, crossing two more Andean ridges over the course of a long ritual day, where the sacrifice make sacred, as the Latin implies, where the exhaustion fuses a community into a single unit that through ritual has reformed their sense of belonging, their sense of place, their obligations to the earth. These local rituals become Panandian in the great events like the Koyariti, where as the Pleiades emerge in the sky, thousands of Andean peoples uh, uh, descend on this ancient sacred valley, the Sinicara, they carry the crosses from their community churches in this perfect expression of synthetic faith of South America. 
500 years of Catholic faith on top of pre-Columbian ideas. The cross has come up through the stations of the cross, but in the shadow of the great Apu, the deity mountain of the Inca, Ausangati, the crosses are placed by the Pablitos in the ice for 48 hours, and then they were removed, uh, empowered by the, by the ice um, uh, uh, to re be returned to the local communities. Well, this kind of syncretic uh, faith of the Southern Andes uh, is balanced in the north by a place where the pre-Columbian voice can still be heard unfettered in the mountains of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta of Colombia, where the descendants of the sun priests of the, uh, of the Tirona civilization in a bloodstained continent have never been conquered by the Spanish. They remain ruled by a ritual priesthood. The training for the priesthood is astonishing. The young acolytes taken away from their families at the world age of three and four, sequestered in the shadowy world of darkness in the environs of the sacred temple for 18 years, learning the complex Baroque religiosity of the belief system that maintains that their rituals and prayers maintain the cosmic balance of the world. They call themselves the elder brothers and dismiss the rest of us who have ruined the world as the younger brothers. And they speak in full paragraphs of our need to change our ways. The pilgrimages of the initiates after 18 years taken out to see the glory of the earth for the first time on a journey from the sea to the ice bringing the products of the coast to the mountains, from the mountains to the coast, weaving a web of sanctity over the earth itself in which every ripple in the landscape resonates with mythic significance. And still, even if the sacred sites are dominated by architecture, it doesn't stop the elder brothers from doing what they've done since the time of Columbus, praying for our collective well-being. As Mamo Camilo once told me, peace in Colombia won't matter anything if the three sides simply come together to maintain a war against nature. It is time, he said, to make peace with the entire natural world. Well, if we slip for a moment from the new world into the realm of Africa and ask ourselves a fundamental question, why is it that when we ponder the great religions of the world, there's one continent left out? Why can we possibly view voodoo, which is simply a fond word from Dahomey, as some kind of black magic cult, when it's simply the distillation of profound religious ideas that came over during the tragic diaspora and became sown in the fertile soil of the new world. Voodoo is no black magic cult. It's a complex metaphysical worldview in which the believer has direct access to the divine, which is why Africans say, you white people go to church and speak about God. We dance in the temple and become God. Spirit possession is not some kind of pathological event it is the hand of divine grace as people walk in and out of their spirit realm with an ease and impunity that astonishes the ethnographic observer. And because you are the God, you cannot be harmed. And that's why you see these theatrical gestures cutting into the skin before a fetish symbol in Togo, or more profoundly voodoo acolytes in Haiti in a state of trance, handling burning embers with impunity, an astonishing example of the body's ability to affect uh, the mind's ability to affect the body that bears it when catalyzed in a state of extreme excitation. Voodoo is no black magic cult. That was the, that was the creation of racist uh, 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 authors of Pulp Fiction and RKO movies in the 1940s. Voodoo is the divine religion of Africa. So we have this idea that these cultures, quaint and colorful, are somehow destined to fade away as if by natural laws, if their failed attempts at being modern, nothing could be further from the truth. Technology is no threat to culture. Change is certainly no threat to culture. What is a threat to culture is power. These are not quaint and colorful and, 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 and delicate societies. These are dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And that's actually an optimistic observation because if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. I traveled to Borneo many years ago to live amongst the nomadic Penan, the last nomads of the Southeast Asian rainforest. And nomads, I always wanted to live with. I wanted to live in a place wet with the innocence of birth because nomadic societies are profoundly different. How do you measure wealth in a society in which everything has to be carried on your back and there's no incentive to accumulate anything? 
Well, in the Penan culture, wealth is explicitly defined as a strength of social relations between people, because if they fray, everybody suffers. Sharing is an automatic reflex. There's no word for thank you in their language. Everything is shared. I once gave a cigarette to an old Penan woman and watched in amazement as she tore it apart to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably to the encampment, rendering the product useless, but honoring her obligation to share. And the sounds of the forest inform the lives of the people, the, 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 the dialogue that exists of a people who lack the written word and instead see in the flight of a hornbill, the cursive script of nature. But now, of course, the sounds have become the sounds of machinery. Within a single generation, the people were assaulted by the highest rate of tropical deforestation on earth. Uh, suddenly, rivers that one ran clean were laden with silt. It seemed a half Sarawak was slipping away to the South China Sea where the freighters hung light on the horizon, ready to fill their holes with raw logs ripped from the heart of the forest. Women reduced to servitude and prostitution in industrial camps, children suffering from ailments no long never known in the forest. Men humiliated, uh, eventually standing up in this quixotic gesture of power, blowpipes against bullno bulldozers, electrified the international community, but no match for the power of the Malaysian state. And so in a single generation, I bore witness to a way of life that was morally inspired, inherently right, and yet had been crushed along with the forest that gave it birth. Now the industrial eye, Industrial intrusion in these lands reflects a certain worldview. And that worldview distilled in Descartes, Descartes' adage that all that exists is mind and matter was antithetical to the belief of the first peoples of Australia. And when the British washed ashore in Australia, they saw people that looked strange, who had a mater simple material culture. But what really offended the British is the Aboriginal people had no interest in improving upon their mater material lot. And because progress and optimism were the hallmarks of Europe at that time, the British in their inimitable way concluded the Aborigines weren't human at all, and they began to kill them. As recently as 1902, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether or not Aboriginal peoples were human at all. As recently as the 1960s, a school book used in schools across Australia, a treasury of fauna of Australia, listed the abos as amongst the interesting form of wildlife of the country. But what was in fact going on was a devotional philosophy too subtle for the British to understand. The dreaming, the song line, the purpose of life in Australia wasn't to change anything. It wasn't a culture based on progress. It was a culture in, 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 infused with stasis. The purpose of life was not to change anything, it was to do the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. It would be as if all we had ever done was prune the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. Now again, I'm not saying who's right and who's wrong. Had we followed this devotional trajectory, we would not have put a man on the moon. But again, we wouldn't be talking about global climate change and our capacity to transform the biophysical life supports of the planet. So if industry is one threat to culture, ideology is even more pernicious, be it the ubiquitous cult of the modern or the Marxist mania of communist ideology. This is a nun at Angkor Wat whose feet and hands have been sliced from the body for the crime of pursuing the Dharma during the era of the killing fields. And if we slip into Tibet where I spend a great deal of time we see the consequences of a civilization brought down by the man who had the dubious distinction, Mao Zedong, of killing more of his own people in his lifetime than Hitler and Stalin combined. And when the ruler of China whispered into the ears of a young 14th Dalai Lama that all religion was poison, His Holiness knew what to expect. As a jackboot came into China with the final conquest in 1959, two million Tibetans would be killed for their religious beliefs. 6,000 sacred temples crushed to riprap and dust. And what was it about the Dharma that threatened the Marxist materialists of Beijing? Well, all life is suffering, the first of the noble truths. By that, the Buddha didn't mean that all life was negative. He just meant that shit happens. The second of the noble truths was a notion that 
suffering was caused by ignorance. By that he didn't mean stupidity, he meant the tendency of people to cling to the cruel illusion of our own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third was a revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth was a delineation of a spiritual practice that if followed had the promise of a transformation of the human heart. Well, some years ago, we made a film called The Buddhist Science of the Mind. And it was my good fortune to travel with a remarkable man, a good friend now, Mathieu Ricard, who grew up in a house of luminaries in Paris. His father was France's most prominent Western philosopher. His mother was an artist. He learned piano from Stravinsky. He knew photography from Cartier-Bresson, anthropology at the feet of Claude Lévi-Strauss. He was himself a molecular biologist in the lab uh, of a Nobel laureate at the Pasteur Institute, when one day he realized there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness. So he became a Tibetan monk in the land where he had always been happy. And with us on this journey was also Sherab Barma, a traditional Amshi doctor. And beginning at the monastery of uh, Tupten Sholin, under the grace of the late Trusta Grimpache, we went on a journey of the heart to experience a true wisdom hero, not of the West, um, but rather of the East, a bodhisattva, a woman who had achieved enlightenment, but elected to stay in the realm of samsara to facilitate the illumination and liberation of all other sentient beings. We began at Shiwang Monastery in an 18-day celebration of Guru Rinpoche as he transmitted the Dharma to Tibet, the Mani Rindu. We then began to walk high into the Himalayas, up into the snow and past the cave where Sherab, as part of his seven years of medical training, had spent one full year in medical, in meditation and retreat. And as Sherab, uh, as Mathieu recited the sutra, Sherab told us about this woman, beautiful as a girl, forced to marry, escaped the hands of her fiance to pursue a life of the Dharma, crawled down a human latrine, covered with human excrement, cleaned up by the monks at Temple Che Monastery, goes over the mountains of the 18,000 Nangpala Pass, becomes ordained as a Tibetan nun, comes back uh, over and goes into life for a long retreat. And for 45 years, she has lived in a single cell, reciting a single mantra. And Sherab is now treating her in her old age. And because of this, we have a chance to meet her. And we do. And as we approach the cell, the door opens to bring sunlight onto the face of someone who has been isolated for 45 years. And you might expect the woman to be mad, but she radiates loving compassion. And as Mathieu later said, this is the efficacy, the evidence of the, the, the truth of the Buddhist science of the mind, the serenity of the practitioner. And later a Tibetan monk said to me, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And so the Tibetans leave it to us to ask why we continue to tolerate the wrath of China as it sweeps over the civilization of Tibet. They cast their future upon the Diamond Sutra, the notion that candles are fleeting, that light fades into the day, that all is um, illusory and that all will yield to another reality. So in the end, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of world do we want to live in? A monochromatic world of, of uh, monotony or a polychromatic world of diversity? Do we want our children to wake up and, and as if from a dream, having never even remembered that there are other possibilities for life itself? Culture is not trivial. This, it is not decorative. Culture is not the prayers we utter or the costumes we wear. Ultimately, culture is about a body of ethical and moral values that we place around e each individual to keep at bay, to keep the barbaric heart of humanity at bay, um, to allow us to make sense out of sensation, to find order in the universe and meaning in the universe, to do what Lincoln said, always seek the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when the restraints of culture are lost, when individuals by coercion or volition turn their backs on tradition, often only to secure a rung, a place on the a, a rung of a, a, a ladder, of, on the lowest rung of a ladder that goes nowhere. Look at the points of chaos, these images from the Genocide Museum in Kigali in Rwanda. 
Happily, nation states are realizing that indigenous people don't embarrass the nation state, they contribute to it if the state's prepared to accept diversity. When the British arrived in the Arctic, they took the Inuit to be savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both were wrong. There was no better measure of genius, in fact, than the ability to survive in a harsh environment in which everything had to be forged from the cold. Sleds in which the runners were made of fish wrapped in caribou skin. Peter Freuken, the great companion of the Danish explorer Newt Rasmussen, famously said that the great thing about an Inuit, an Inuk, Kamatek or sled is that you could always eat it if you ran out of food because the structure was made of frozen meat. The Inuit don't fear the cold, they take advantage of it. Blood on ice is not a sign of death, it's an affirmation of life itself. I recorded a story from Arctic Bay in the Lancaster Sound of a time when the, 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 the Canadian government was forcing the Inuit into settlements and this family's grandfather refused to go. He, 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 they took away all of his tools and he walked out of his igloo, it said, and, 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 and defecated and forged a tool from the frozen excrement and then used that to move away into the darkness having killed a dog. Now, whether that's true or not, it's a marvelous metaphor of the the, the ingenious ability to survive in this harsh environment. A harsh environment now that now, of course, is melting from beneath the people themselves. And having endured so much, now they're dealing with something that they cannot confront. And that, of course, is climate change. A way of life, a way of being, a vision of the future is literally melting from beneath the people of the circumpolar north. So let me close with one more optimistic story. In the wake of 9-11, I wanted to tell a story of Islam. So we traveled to Mali in West Africa, Northwest Africa, and we began our journey, of course, in the great Muslim centers of Jinnah and Timbuktu. Timbuktu, which at a time when London and, and Paris were small cities, Timbuktu, like Damascus and Cairo and Baghdad, was a great center of Islamic learning with 25,000 university students. Indeed, the entire knowledge of the Renaissance of the ancient Greeks only survived to inform the Renaissance because it was kept alive in the documents of the great Islamic scholars like Avicenna. And indeed, in Timbuktu to this day, you can come upon ancient documents uh, heralding the time of Islamic scholarship, documents that speak of botany, chemistry, astronomy, uh, medicine, philosophy, mathematics. So we traveled from Timbuktu north, Timbuktu being the port on the southern shore of the Sea of the Sand that is the Western Sahara. And we followed the ancient trade route north to Marrakesh, which in 52 days would at one point carry the gold of West Africa to Europe, remembering that until the discovery of the new world, two thirds of Europe's gold came from equatorial West Africa. Our destination was an ancient salt mine uh, that had been worked since the, uh, for at least 800 years. Salt that was not extracted as a condiment, but as sacred essence of the desert. Salt that at one point traded ounce for ounce with gold on that trade route. This was a journey that you had to make if you were a young Tamashek or Berber uh, youth before you could marry, because only the desert hones the devotion. And as we trudged north to this ancient mine, we suddenly encountered en route what could only be described as a biblical scene. My friend Isa Muhammad took one look at the mine and he said simply, I would not bring my wife here. I asked some smugglers what country they came from and they just said there are no countries here. And over the course of our time at that mine, two events occurred that I will never forget. First, we encountered this man who from his papers was chronologically younger than us but physically broken by years at the mine. He was serving in debt peonage. He had incurred a debt to save the life of his child with a merchant. And by the terms of that debt, he was never going to escape it. Uh, and we examined his documents. All that he owned were the clothes on his back, a ragged burmouche, a tin can of brackish water drawn from a desert well, and the salt walls of the shack in which he slept. And his entire debt was less than the cost of a dinner for two in London. And so my friend and I happily gave him that money, never discovering whether he was telling us the truth, was he later killed for the money, 
uh, did he escape and get back to his family? Because as we gave him the money and as he blessed Allah for the gift, a veil of yellow cloud came through the mine, a sandstorm that swept him into obscurity. And then on the way south to Timbuktu, we came upon a caravan that we had met going north. A strange rainstorm had cracked open the Sahara sky. The salt had gotten wet. If it get wet, it, it cracks and loses all value. So this entire caravan, the camels of several families, eight or nine young men with all the wealth of their families, their responsibility had been forced to stop in the desert. And there is no margin for error on this 40 day camel trip. And they were down to no food, no fodder for their camels, 220 kilometers away from the nearest well, down to one liter of water between them all. Now in the Sahara, you can live for two weeks without food, but without water, you die overnight. It's said of the truck smugglers of Mauritania, they say that the best thing about brake fluid in a truck is it keeps you off the battery acid. And as we came upon this caravan, we saw this one lad walking 20 kilometers into the desert to a spot where they thought they might be able to dig for water. And what did they do with their last reserves of water? They immediately kindled a twig fire and brewed us tea, honoring the adage of the Bedouin, you will kill the last goat that gives the milk that keeps your only children alive to feed a wandering stranger who turns up at your tent, cold, lonely, in need of shelter, because you never know when you will be that stranger in need of human help. And in the wake of 9-11, this was a story we wanted to tell about Islam. And as I watched Muhammad in this photograph that I took as he poured me that first cup of tea from the last liter of their water, I thought to myself as an anthropologist, this is why I do this work. And these are the moments that allow all us as human beings to, um, to hope. Thank you very much. Hi, Wade. Um, thank you so much for that talk. I'm just going to stop sharing your screen so everyone can see you full faced when you start answering the questions. Um, uh, for everyone joining us, please feel free to write your questions into the Q&A box um, and I will try to get through as many as I can. Um, but the first one comes from Richard. Um, Richard asks, can having this global view help us overcome the identity politics that plight our current humanity? What piece of advice would you give to someone to help them view the world better? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that in, in a way, anthropology is the antidote to Trump. It's the antidote to nativism. You know, in cultural myopia, the idea that my way is a real way. I mean, that, that, that's, that's been a curse on humanity. I mean, when, when Herodotus, the great traveler, uh, four or five centuries before Christ returned to Athens and had the audacity to say that something interesting was going on in Persia, uh, Plato wanted him banned from Athens for the audacity or for the gall of, uh, of uh, suggesting anyone else could be of interest besides the Greeks. Well, you know, this is, you know, most native names of their tribe is the people, the implication being the blokes over the hill are savages. And, 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 and ant anthropology is the antidote to that. I mean, that's why Ruth, Ruth Benedict said the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. And, uh, um, you know, identity politics is more of the same. I mean, the, the, the really extraordinary thing about that genetic information and, and the reason, Dana, that it's kind of the, the moonshot of your generation, you know, the two scientific moments of illumination that will be spoken about 50,000 years from now, one was my generation as Apollo went around the dark side of the moon and revealed for the first time on Christmas Eve, 1968, what the planet really was. You know, I mean, a, a marble of blue floating in the velvet void of space, you know. But this journey into our fiber puts a dagger in the heart of our beings. The genetic journey puts a dagger in the heart of racism. And, and it puts a dagger in the idea that there's a hierarchy of culture. You know, we, we are all just uh, expressions of our own adaptive impulses. Each culture has something to say. Everyone deserves to be heard. Um, and anthropology is such a powerful and important discipline. It's not this sort of 
esoteric academic pursuit of sort of, you know, pith helmeted men on the corners of the colonial world. You know, if you think about it, Dana, your great grandfather, maybe your great great grandfather, the, the certitudes of life in Edwardian England about the role of men, the role of women, the, the, the nature of the family, um, the nature of race, uh, all of those ideas you don't adhere to. And in fact, many of them you'd find to be morally repugnant. Uh, and we can certainly see that the social movements of women's aspirations, people of color's aspirations, gay people's aspirations have created this new modern world, right? But we have to remember that something had to shatter those certitudes of the Victorian era to allow these social movements to happen. And what did that was a small group of uh, American uh, anthropologists uh, under uh, uh, Franz Boas, who had the audacity to say in the 1920s that race was a was a total social construct with no meaning in biology, that that uh, men didn't manners didn't make the man, men and women invented the manners, uh, that that uh, every culture had something to say, each deserved to be heard, each was a product of its own history. These ideas were so radical at the time that they were shattering of the European mind, the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. And that's why Boas deserves to rank with Freud and Einstein and, 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 uh, and Darwin as the four great intellectual streams that birth modernity as we know it. And the way I try to explain this to your generation is that if you think it's normal, Dana, that you could have a friend who's African-American uh, with a girlfriend who's, who's um, Chinese, if you, if you think it's normal that two men, a gay couple can be married and have children and, and give as much love to that family as a man and a woman would in a heterosexual union. If you understand what a young Afro-American woman of mixed heritage says when she points to herself and says, that's not the statue to the Confederacy, I'm the statue because look at my face. My face tells you that a white overseer raped my great grandmother. I am the statue of Confederacy. If you understand that, you are a child of anthropology because it was anthropology that allowed us to begin to think in new ways that now define the modern uh, um, uh, experiment as we know it. So in this, in this sense, identity politics brings us backward. What we need to do is find ways that every culture can benefit from the genius of modernity with, with, with that engagement not implying the death of who they are. Uh, when we recognize that the great lesson of anthropology is that humanity is one great interconnected whole. Uh, thank you for that. Um, the, so the next question comes from Sandra, um, who asks, um, how, sorry, how do you think, hmm, how do you feel is essential for an individual to help support cultural diversity in these times? Well, I mean, the, I, I think, you know, supporting cultural diversity is, is, um, is first of all recognizing and, and, and uh, the, the truth of what cultural diversity is and, 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 and working to um, collaborate with and help and support um, those who are fighting to maintain their cultural um, uh, identities uh, as ethnicities. You know, it's not a one-way street. Um, and, and, and the critical thing is that the idea that these cultures are sort of destined to fade away um, is really um, a, a dangerous thought because it makes us passive. But once you recognize that these cultures are being driven out of existence, you can ask fundamental questions. Um, do we need that dam? You know, who's motivated? What's behind that deforestation plan? You know, what, what's going on with that mine? What, it, what, what is this conceit of modernity that tries to uh, um, export Western education to every corner of the world as if the people weren't already educating their own people. You know, what is, what is this idea of development where every indice of the development uh, 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 paradigm has very little to do with quality of life? You know, um, how, how is the development paradigm and the myth of modernity simply used as an excuse to disenfranchise people and transform them from being who they are? often with the motivation of getting access to natural re resources on lands that those people have occupied for all of their uh, memory. So, you know, begin, beginning to be critical of these, of, of these um, 
uh, gestures of of um, of, uh, of of conceit, if you will, um, remembering always that the um, uh, you know the, the essence of colonialism is to make the person ashamed of who they are, um, and and we can all um, work together uh, to celebrate our common heritage. Uh, the next question comes from an anonymous attendee who asks, how does youth culture vary across different societies? Well, one of the things that, I, that, that you, you see uh, in a classic sense of is, is that um, the failure in our tradition to acknowledge the transformation from childhood to adulthood. You know, we do it in poetry. I mean, that was what William Blake was all about, journeys from um, innocence to experience. But most societies around the world have very uh, strict and rigorous initiation rites, which often include um, a liminal space between you know, youth and adulthood, uh, often marked by um, rituals that can be described almost as ordeals. Often pain, isolation is involved. And the reason that these rites of passage involve often uh, physical exposure, physical pain, is because the message has to be absolutely clear. You know, life as you knew it is over. Uh, childhood is over. Now it is your time to take your place. And if you don't take that burden of responsibility, you threaten the integrity and the cultural survival of all of our people. And, 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 and I think that in, in many ways, um, you know, the trauma of the teenage years, which of course means the years in between, is an artificial construct um, because we don't acknowledge um, um, the, the, the profundity that puberty, for example, represents, particularly for a young woman, you know, where literally your body is transformed in a matter of months. Um, so, I, so I think that um, uh, one, of, one of the things you see in, 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 in traditional cultures is, is this um, powerful moment of transition where you know one day you are a child and, 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 and then a month later you are a very different human being. And I think that gives a certain kind of solidarity, a, a sense of um, belonging. You know, one of the things that obviously has happened in, in American society in particular is that we've embraced the cult of the individual with almost uh, iconic intensity, uh, which has given us great mobility and personal freedom but it is also torn deeply at the bonds of family and community. And that's a lot of what you're seeing in the United States today in the response and the, uh, the, the horrific response to COVID. Um, Rachel asks, what are some ways you've observed indigenous people pushing back against the powers that have tried to erase them? Oh, it happens everywhere all the time. I mean, one of the extraordinary things is that indigenous people have become empowered as never before in the courts, uh, on the blockades, uh, in, 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 the, in, in the public uh, discourse. You know, the Penan uh, in an incredible way blockaded their logging roads at tremendous personal risk. You know, Nunavut didn't come, come about because of a sort of benign Canadian government. It was years of activism by uh, Inuk leaders who called for their own homeland, called for control of their resources. Uh, you know, there, there's a kind of a, a marvelous um, um, connectivity of indigenous people um, uh, uh, made possible by digital technology that is in a wonderful way um, eliminating the sense of isolation that many had felt. You know, people are realizing that um, the greatest percentage of the world's intact biodiversity uh, remains on lands that at least titularly are under the control and ownership of indigenous people. You know, I, I, I think it, you know, it, it's extraordinarily exciting uh, to see how um, world attitudes are changing. You know, when I first lived in Colombia, for example, uh, in the 1970s, parents of my friends at the National University would say to me, you know, ¿Por qué quiere vivir con la gente sucia? You know, when I'd be going off to live with the mamas, why do you want to live with the dirty people? Now the last five Colombian presidents, besides um, Ivan Duque, uh, made it their mission to go up to pay homage to the mamos before they became inaugurated as Colombian presidents because they saw that the mamos had emerged as symbols of continuity 
and patrimony in a country that was afflicted by conflict and war. And, and so I think, I, I think you, know, um, you know, it's an ongoing struggle um, and, and uh, it, it's a struggle that needs as many allies as it can uh, attract, but it's, it's a much more hopeful situation today. I mean, this is why we have to pay attention to what the Chinese are doing uh, in, in, in the Northwest of that country to, to, to Uyghurs. I mean, what, what's going on in Tibet? You know, um, you know, we have to stand up for humanity. Um, Richard asks, um, given the historical bookends we see as ends of cultural moments, i.e. the fall of Rome, the burning of Alexandria, et cetera, is it in our humanity to fatalize the future? And should we stand forthright and understand that simply we still exist, therefore we are moving forward? Or should we mourn some of the past? Well, I think we should be cognizant of the past or we'll repeat it as Churchill famously said. Um, but I, but I, I think in terms of what he's getting at, Richard, you know, and what advice I would give to young people is, is that, you know, um, there's a funny kind of thing in our Western civilization that we kind of all think, even if we're not practicing Christians, that there's evil and there's good. And if we only work hard enough, good is gonna triumph over um, evil. And uh, that doesn't seem to happen in history, does it? And my father, who is not a religious man, uh, had a different attitude. He, he said, look, son, good and evil, is all, they're both gonna be always with us. So you've got a choice. What side are you gonna be on? Take your, take your pick and get on with it. And what he meant was that, you know, it's interesting that that old um, heresy in the medi medieval ages where, you know, when, when Catholic priests would ask the obvious question, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil in the universe? And of course, if you ask that question in France in the year 1200, you got burned at the stake. But in Eastern religion, that's not a threatening question. And when Lord Krishna was famously asked by a disciple, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil in the universe? Lord Krishna said, to thicken the plot. In other words, most cultures have a notion of light and darkness, good and evil. And there's a sort of struggle in life to, to resolve um, the conflict so that hopefully good triumphs more often than evil. Um, and when you, when you realize that's the way it is, you, you can adopt a more, what might be seen as almost a Buddhist idea, where, where your, your movement through life is not destined to get somewhere. It's not a goal, it's a state of mind. And that you'll win some environmental battles, say, and you'll lose some environmental battles. You know, you'll have moments of divine grace uh, where, where individuals of extraordinary goodness walk the surface of the planet, and we'll see the absolute distillation of evil in people like Paul Pot or uh, any number of villains of history one could name. Uh, and I think for a young person, it's very important not to think you're gonna win, not to think that good will vanquish evil uh, because it allows you to, to relax and it allows you to keep in the game so that when you get to my age, which is now 66, I kind of feel like I've got the same energy for these issues that I did when I was your age, Dana. Um, I, 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 I've never become bitter uh, because I don't have any expectations. You know, Peter Matthewson, one of my favorite writers, said that anyone who thinks they can change the world is both wrong and dangerous. Now, that's a hard line to accept when you're a young person, but it comes across as wisdom when you become old. He had in mind, of course, people like Hitler, Mao, and Stalin. But what he was really saying is that it just is what it is. Pick your side, get on with it. And if you don't have any expectations, um, you, can, you can be the master of your destiny. You can become the architect of your own life, which is a key to contentment in old age. But more importantly, you can stay in the game without becoming embittered. And there's nothing more unseem unseemly than bitterness in old age. Uh, Mary asks, are there any international efforts occurring to save indigenous languages that are in danger? Oh, of yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this, this is part of the story is that, uh, you know, Michael Krauss, late Michael Krauss wrote a paper in 1992 called The World's Languages in Danger or something like that. And I stumbled upon it in 1998. And uh, he, he then said half the languages of the world were, were, were not being taught to children. 
And I contacted Ken Hale at MIT. I said, is that really true? Because I was an anthropologist, but I hadn't thought in those terms. And Ken Hale said, yeah, that's true. And I was astonished by two things, that statistic, but also why anthropologists weren't screaming about it, or linguists for that matter, more importantly. And Michael Krauss answered my obvious question with two words, Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky had a kind of monopoly on linguistic thought. And that was because on the one hand, he was a darling of the new left because he was so progressive and supported so many uh, uh, social movements uh, spoken out against the war in Vietnam. And his original idea was such a brilliant one. You know, you know, he said the obvious, you know, until he came along, people thought language acquisition was sort of behavioral, you know, like Dana, when you're a little girl, you, you, you say mommy and you get a cookie. But Chomsky said that, look, you know, that's ridiculous. Language acquisition is incredibly complicated. It occurs all over the world at roughly the same age, walk one, talk two. And we must be somehow hardwired as a species to acquire language. And so how, what is the nature of that organ? He didn't mean a physical organ, but a kind of cognitive space that allowed us, unlike other mammals, to acquire language as we do. And so Michael explained it to me this way, with an analogy from biology. If you're, if you're, a, if you're interested in the origin of life, you wanna study DNA, and you don't really care if the DNA comes from a fruit fly or a, a rare panda bear, because it's just DNA. Um, and and the, how that DNA becomes expressed in what we would call biologically phenotype, the fit, you know the form of the creature, it, you know let's leave that to the conservation biologists and the ecologists. We want to get at the origin of life, so let's work with fruit fly DNA. Well, in a way, what Chomsky was saying is that the imagined universal grammar, the holy grail of linguistic theory, this cognitive structure was equivalent to the DNA. And the languages spoken around the world were the, in a way, the physical expression or the phenotypic expression of that cognitive structure. And so what he was essentially saying is what, how that structure is expressed doesn't really matter that much. What we've got to do is get to that structure. And so it got so bad that the study of dictionaries and grammars was not considered serious academic work. Everybody, because of his influence, was focused on the theoretical quest for the holy grail of a, grail of a universal um, uh, grammar, quite blind to the fact that by the day the expressions of that imagined place were dying by the day. And, and I came along in 1998 with the bully pulpit of the National Geographic and with no baggage from being in and part of the linguistic community. It got so bad that if you challenged Chomsky, you, you, you couldn't work. Uh, and I started to scream about it. And uh, with the platform, the geographic, you know, that voice was heard, but more importantly, it was joined. And I shouldn't say joined in the sense of I was the, 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 the vanguard, but it came along at a time when something was just bubbling up. There was a movement of a new generation of linguists who were saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe the emperor's got no clothes. It does matter if these languages disappear. And so in the first decade of this century, suddenly the dam broke and this whole new generation of linguists were publishing books like crazy on language loss and starting efforts to revitalize, to revitalize languages um, and so on. So in, in that sense, um, there was sort of a whole new, um, very exciting movement that is now occurring in, I just spilt some water, um, moving in communities and academic worlds all over the time. But the, the, the problem with all of this is such was the hold of Chomsky for so long that Dana, if you gave me unlimited funds to simply create dictionaries and um, study the grammar and record the, the bones of the languages of the world that are threatened, I could not do it because there are not enough linguists trained in that kind of field linguistic work because of the hold that Chomsky has had. He's a great man with great ideas, a brilliant scholar, legendary, but it had this consequence and that work to slow down what is now a process of reviving, documenting and celebrating the languages of humanity. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this comes from an anonymous attendee who asks, how can we support processes to provide legal tools to indigenous communities to enforce their role as protectors of biodiversity, considering that they have limitations 
um, to access to education, justice, et cetera? Well, you know, again, one of the one of the one of the sort of the conceits we have is that you know these societies are stagnant and that you know that they're not educated. It's just you know, I mean, we live in a modern world. I mean, in the same way that everybody's taking pictures all the time of everybody with their iPhones. I mean, every every traditional culture is is doing the same. You know, people people you know, the difference between how the world was when I was twenty, running around like a vagabond scholar in 1974. You know that's that's heck that's you know that's over almost 50 years ago and uh you know indigenous people are going to school they're educated they're online you know they're communicating i mean the whole point isn't about people hidden away in the forest although some societies do remain uh, uncontacted and that's a delicate story in and of itself but most indigenous people are engaged in the, their own acts of cultural survival young scholars who have become the ethnographers of their own lives um, who are attending universities in every country of the world, who are being empowered and part of this global community. And that's why it's not about the traditional versus the modern. It's, the question is, what kind of world are we all going to live in? And how can, we, how can we allow every society, every individual to have benefit of the genius of modernity, but critically not with the demand that they give up their own ethnicity? And that's why schooling around the world is so poisonous, because it's really often not about the transmission of skills or knowledge, but, but it's a socialization of young people um, uh, into a kind of a, a universal cadre for the economy. Uh, you know, we, we, we condemn residential schools in Canada and the United States for what they were, but the base, basic pedagogy is still in place in Africa and Asia and all over the, the, the third, quote unquote, third world. So, you know, in terms of empowering indigenous people, if you do some homework, you'll discover that, that there's an indigenous lawyer speaking for every indigenous people. You know, there, there, there are organizations of lawyers working in collaboration with indigenous people. You know, we're not, we're not talking now about the, the, the very few remaining remote, isolated, in some cases, uncontacted societies. We're talking about the entire range of humanity uh, um, um, that is interacting with the modern world as we speak. How do we allow them to maintain the richness of their cultural traditions while still being part of a changing world, even as they themselves will change. It's not about freezing anybody in time. It's really about what kind of world do you want to live in? Uh, kind of, you know, uh, and, I, and I think that's what this is all about. That's a poetry of cultural diversity. Um, uh, and, and that's why, you know, it, 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 every culture, uh, to lose a culture is, is to lose something of ourselves. Uh, well, thank you so much, Wade, for an incredible talk and very thoughtful answers to the audience questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us from home, wherever you are. Um, we hope you enjoyed the talk, and um, we hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much, Dana. Look forward to seeing you again.